In addition to the problems of memory and its ultimate reliability, we encounter problems with relying completely on the so-called objectivity and facts of the social sciences or journalism. In quantum physics, for example, just the observation of nuclear particles can change their behavior. The same is true, one could argue, for the social sciences. Anthropologists who visit so-called primitive tribes change their behavior in significant ways just by their presence. And the primary purpose of sociology and psychology is to study behavior to change it. One can only hope in positive ways, though it certainly doesn't always turn out that way. And in the contemporary context of cable news, even so-called straight or hard news, the reliance of at least two credible or authoritative witnesses who've gone on the record, has become suspect. Just the selection of what to report on and the details of one's reportage can reflect a so-called bias. And as the right accuses the mainstream or lamestream media of being too liberal, the left remains incredulous at any claim that their critics' news is fair and balanced. With the increasing reliance of American citizens on so-called advocacy journalism to get their news, Fox News on the right and MSNBC on the left, for example, it's becoming increasingly difficult for many to distinguish between news, sensationalism, yellow journalism, and outright propaganda. I've actually heard a family member say, for years I was uninformed, now I watch Fox News. <laughs> How are we supposed to take any of this seriously, we ask, when Tea Party rallies for Glenn Beck find as their antidote rallies hosted by Jon Stewart and the fake news of the Comedy Channel. What is the truth, we wonder, when we're bombarded daily by so-called journalists with ever more partisan political points of view? Who can we really trust, and how as writers can we earn the trust of our readers? To add to the confusion, this strange and relatively new genre, invented and refined in the 60s and 70s by such writers as Truman Capote, Norman Mailer, Hunter S. Thompson, and Tom Wolfe, creative nonfiction seems constantly to shift and evolve like a literary chimera, written by such diverse and remarkable contemporary voices as Joanne Beard, Jamaica Kincaid, Annie Dillard, and Leah Purpura. Creative nonfiction, in fact, is often as different as the writers who write it. And the people who write it may have begun as poets or fiction writers rather than journalists, finding those forms inadequate to tell the true stories they must tell. All the complex questions I've raised here so far may seem impertinent, silly, or completely irrelevant until one considers how popular creative nonfiction has become since 9-11. In such a time of insecurity and fear, the collective trauma that terrible event had on all of us, people seem more than ever to be asking, what's the truth and where can I find it? And because of the growing hunger for this thing called truth and the growing popularity of the fourth genre in the first decade of the 21st century, writers have struggled with many questions about what creative nonfiction really is and how to write it finding it almost impossible sometimes to distinguish between autobiographical fiction and memoir. The well-known case of James Fry and others illustrates the point. Fry wrote a novel that he couldn't sell, the story goes, and then decided to change it a bit and market it as a memoir, simply because the form had become so popular. Oprah bought the book, raved about it in her book club, then when the website Smoking Gun revealed that Fry had fudged the truth a bit, <laughs> Oprah chewed him out in a very public way on her show in 2006, only to apologize to him months later. Oprah, was your description of how she died true? James, she committed suicide, yes. Oprah, she hung herself? James, I mean, that was one of the details I altered about her. Oprah, okay, and why? James, because all the way through the book I altered details about every single one of the characters to re render them unidentifiable. Oprah. So how did she die? James. She cut her wrists. Oprah. Hanging is more dramatic than cutting your wrists? Is that why you chose hanging? James. I don't think either is more dramatic than the other. Oprah. Why did you lie? Why did you have to lie about the time you spent in jail? Why did you do that? James, I think one of the coping mechanisms I developed was sort of this image of myself that was greater probably than, not probably, that was greater than I actually was. 
In order to get through the experience of the addiction, I thought of myself as being tougher than I was and badder than I was, and it helped me cope. When I was writing the book, instead of being as introspective as I should have been, I clung to that image. Oprah, and did you cling to that image because that's how you wanted to see yourself, or did you cling to that image because that would make a better book? James, probably both. We're shocked by what happened to Fry, what he did to himself as a writer, shocked that he'd lie and destroy such a promising career, yet as writers, we find ourselves understanding why he might have become confused, how he might have become blind to his own story, deceiving himself and others, becoming a kind of unreliable narrator and writer all at once. Certainly, we must understand even a little why a writer might do such a desperate-seeming thing after he'd worked for years on a book he must have cared about deeply and wanted people to read. In fact, as Fry suggests in this interview, he chose at first to write autobiographical fiction instead of creative nonfiction, in part to protect or hide the identity of the innocent, or to protect the innocent or themselves from those who might do them harm. Something creative nonfiction writers struggle with as they write about real people still alive or events whose significance might be in question. Whether we revile such writers or find even the slightest empathy for them, James Story and others are cautionary tales for all of us who write. Even though, to avoid such outcomes as we face our own dilemmas of identity and self-awareness, we're tempted to abandon ourselves as writers to abandon our own distinctive and important lives and voices, and never to do what we must, tell our own important stories in our own ways, as honestly as we can. The case of Margaret Jones, also known as Margaret Seltzer, seems extreme but worth noting. When New York Times book reviewer Michiko Kutani called her book Love and Consequences, quote, humane and deeply affecting, end quote, the story of a mixed-race gang member, it soon became a bestseller. Later, though, when Joan's own sister revealed that the author was actually an Episcopalian white woman from the suburbs who'd affected an African-American dialect in interviews, the publisher, Riverhead, pulled the book and refunded the money for all who'd bought it. In such a case, we think the author's decision to lie about who she really is and to fabricate an entire fiction all the while calling it a memoir easily crosses a professional and ethical line. And though we don't know what might have motivated the author to create such a ruse, we find less empathy for her in any case. And the consequences of her actions seem, at least for most, both predictable and appropriate. A more extreme case, perhaps, at least in the sense that the Holocaust is a subject no one wishes to exaggerate, to sentimentalize, or to make less credible, is Herman Rosenblatt's faked memoir, Angel at the Fence. A mostly concocted love story he meant to be inspirational. The, quote, single greatest love story, unquote, Oprah Winfrey said she'd heard on her show for 22 years, was about Rosenblatt and his wife, Roma Radziki Rosenblatt, who allegedly threw apples over the fence to Rosenblatt imprisoned in a subcamp of Buchenwald, saving his life, then met him again on a blind date at Coney Island 12 years later. When Winfrey and the book's publisher, Riverhead Books, discovered the literary fraud, editors requested Rosenblatt's advance and canceled publication of the book. Poor Oprah. As one reads about such cases, the creative nonfiction writer's dilemma clearly becomes more complicated. Where is the line, for example, between changing details to create greater vividness and verisimilitude, inventing, changing, or combining scenes or characters for dramatic effect, and affecting a completely false persona? The author of the controversial 1999 biography, Dutch, A Memoir of Ronald Reagan, Edmund Morris, for example, became known as, quote, the most reviled biographer in America. Unquote, when he used what he called a fictional conceit by inserting himself as a first-person observer, an actual fictional character into President Reagan's life story, following the man around for the time he was a child until he was a president for two terms. Even though the book received some decent reviews and stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for six weeks, perhaps in part because of the controversy it created, the author's narrative authority and reputation as a biographer diminished, some say, as a result of his choice to insert such fictional elements. 
while others might actually celebrate his willingness to push the form a bit to risk the very controversy it creates, the ethical questions still remain. Certainly, writing an already risky enterprise can seem incredibly intimidating to a writer new to the form. And the fear of crossing the line between memoir and fiction has the potential ultimately for us inadvertently to silence ourselves. Who am I to tell my own story, we might ask. My life is boring. Maybe I should write something else. Maybe I should watch TV. But if we're willing to risk exposure of the most intimate details of our lives, the most courageous act any writer can choose, we must constantly ask ourselves if we're motivated by ego, a blinding obsession, or a sincere search for the truth. If we have the right balance of objectivity and subjectivity, the right distance, fearing that we might cross that fuzzy line between artistic license and outright lying. For most of us, our first task is to know ourselves, as Socrates said, and that's difficult, especially when we know that we must first lie to ourselves before we can lie to others. And self-deception is far easier to fall victim to than most of us want to admit. Straight or hard news journalists writing the journalistic essay or simply reporting on the day's news usually focus on public events, or if they're investigative journalist news about to become public. And the jobs seem fairly straightforward and a good bit more objective than writing personal essays. Because thousands of people may witness such events firsthand, and millions of people may witness them secondhand through television and the internet, the truth, what really happened, can be fairly simple to report, at least in the sense that we can almost all agree on the truth in the description of the events. And despite the rise of so-called advocacy journalism, the journalistic profession still has strict ethical codes which make respected journalists work hard to avoid rumor and to confirm facts and evidence. Their careers depend upon it. Two jets flying to the World Trade Center, journalists report, and all of us are changed, utterly. As with the Challenger explosion, or the assassinations of John F., or Robert Kennedy, or Martin Luther King Jr., we can still remember where we were the moment when we heard the news. Even so complex as our feelings might be, the distinction between observers, participants, victims, and perpetrators, villains we mostly agree, even when others consider them martyrs or heroes, is fairly straightforward and simple once investigators have researched and documented the events carefully. And yes, while we must acknowledge that those whom we consider villains are often themselves complex and deeply human, for most of us there's still a clear, unambiguous, and unmistakable distinction between perpetrators and victims. Once we begin to interpret events, however, to ask the larger questions, how and why did it happen? What does it mean? Why is it important to me? The story may become far more ambiguous and complex. And as partisans with competing points of view begin to take sides, moving almost immediately in an impulse to find someone to blame or even scapegoat, the truth becomes more difficult to parse and interpret. And too often people harden into positions that no amount of truth-telling and evidence-giving can shake them from. A madman shoots a Democratic congresswoman in the forehead in front of a Safeway, then murders a well-respected judge and a nine-year-old girl interested in civics. And in the shift from what happened to the interpretations of those events, the talking heads on competing cable news outlets shouting at each other across the airways just hours after the event took place. There are, quote, as I write in my Forward to the Touchstone Anthology of Contemporary Creative Nonfiction, at least as many truths as there are those who believe what they want to believe, unquote. Even when villains and victims remain relatively clear-cut, the distinction between literary and political points of view may blur, making objectivity seem all the more elusive. Even so, when a private experience is part of a public event, merging public and private tragedy, for example, one point of view in all the senses of that term, first person, psychological, emotional, or political, that single unique point of view, especially when written with the most unflinching honesty by a direct observer, victim or survivor, may change that public event for all of us in the most subtle and meaningful ways, deepening the event and helping us all to make better sense of it. <laughs>